wonderful to be uh, back in Bristol, so it still feels like home after many of these years. As uh, you were saying, I grew up in Downing, just about three miles away from here. I um, used to ride my bike around this area. It was all fields in those days, of course, and all these extra buildings that they put up and some famous things. Uh, but um, it is um, uh, very good to be to be here. In fact, uh, I was last week. I was um, I gave a date. I was thinking about this this talk, and as I was starting out, I was reading the um, the morning uh, readings in morning prayer that day, and it was that bit in Luke four which said, "No prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown." <laughs> slightly worried me. I um, wondered whether God was trying to tell me something at that point. I hope that doesn't apply today. Uh, although I it's funny how you know the morning reading sometimes speaks to you. I was reading this morning's one. I don't know whether you noticed that little verse in the psalm uh, that said, You, Lord, of your goodness, have made my hill so strong. Which is obviously a reference to your bishop. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that he's been working out recently. But uh, it is... Um, Good to be here and to think about this very important theme about um, connecting with our communities. When you're in church, I wonder if you ever just stop to think to yourself, why am I doing this? Well, what is the point? And uh, there's an old story, you've probably heard this one, Vicar jokes go around quite a lot, don't they? Uh, where um, there's a, a boy uh, in bed on a Sunday morning uh, and his mother comes to him and says, um, come on, get out of bed, you've got to go to church. And, uh, and he, says, um, he says, no, I don't want to go to church. Uh, and she says, you, you've, got, you've, got, you've really got to go, you've got to go. And he says, no, 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 I don't want to stay in bed. And uh, the argument goes on for a little while and, and eventually the son says to the mother, okay, just give me, th give me three good reasons why I should go to church. She says, okay, here are three. Number one, it's quarter past ten and you'll soon be late. And number two, they'll miss you if you aren't there. Number three, you are the vicar. <laughs> now you may have had moments like that if you are the vicar of a church. You've probably had moments like that if you're not the vicar of a church where you're wondering why am I doing this? And you wonder what is the point of what we're doing. You may even wonder sometimes, well, why is it me? Why am I involved in this thing? Uh, and not everybody else. You may think of your friends, your, your neighbours, your family members, and you think, well, why am I a Christian? Uh, and why are they not Christians? And those kind of questions come to us uh, quite often. And I suppose once we start asking those questions, uh, we find there's a rather frustrating biblical answer that comes to us again and again, uh, which is that the reason why you and I are Christians and others are not is somehow... Not because you and I have some great spiritual capacity which has enabled us uh, to perceive uh, the glory of Jesus Christ and to respond to God. It's not that you and I have some psychic power that other people don't. It is somehow hidden in the mystery that God chose us. And it's a frustrating answer because it doesn't seem to be much of an answer and it raises more questions uh, than it answers. But you can't avoid that sex that comes right the way through the Old Testament, it comes right the way through the New Testament, that little word of Jesus, that you did not choose me, but I chose you. In other words, the answer to that question, uh, why are we involved, why are we doing this, is something to do with the great Christian doctrine of election. Now, that doctrine of election may think, seem a strange place to start when we're thinking about this theme of connecting with our communities. But I think it's actually the right place to start because well, you can't really avoid this sense of this sense that God chooses. He does it all the time. It's not just that little bit in John's Gospel where Jesus says, you know, you did not choose me, but I chose you. It's right there, back, right the way through the Old Testament. You just look at the book of Genesis. And sometimes, I did this a little while ago, just was read through the book of Genesis with an eye to this idea, this idea that God chooses. And it keeps on happening. God chooses humanity out of all the other animals that he could have chosen. He somehow chooses this particular species to bear his image. Uh, he chooses Abel and not Cain when they bring their offerings to him. Why does he choose Abel's offering, not Cain's? Well, we don't know. 
He chooses Noah and not the others. He chooses Abraham out of all the families of the earth. He chooses Isaac and not Ishmael. He chooses Jacob and not Esau. He chooses Joseph and not the other brothers. He chooses Ephraim and not Manasseh. Time and time again, God just chooses. And he doesn't usually give you a reason why he chooses. He just does. He chooses one part. And of course, he raises the question for us, this very question of why God chooses. It does seem rather unfair and arbitrary. And when we ask that question, why does God choose one rather than another? Why has God chosen you rather than your brother or sister or friend or neighbours? Then, well, in one sense, we're not usually told why. Certainly it's not because we or any of those characters in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, were any better than the others. In fact, it's almost the other way around. It's very often the fact that the people that God chooses somehow seem to be worse than the others. Actually, Abraham tells lies about Sarah as his sister to save his own skin. Uh, Jacob deceives his brother Esau. Uh, Joseph is a spoiled brat. All the way through the story, you get the sense it's not because these people are any better. In fact, most of the time, the narrator seems to want us to make us see their flaws very clearly. In, in fact, the whole of Abraham's family history, this family that God chooses, is actually the story of, a, of deception and faithlessness and violence and everything else you can think of. So in one sense, when we ask that question, why does God choose one over another, we get no answer. It's simply hidden in the mystery of God's will. We just don't know. But there's another sense in which you can ask that question, why does God choose one rather than another? another? In which, in which is the question of, for what purpose has God chosen this particular person? And that is a question we do get an answer to. We do get an answer to that question. We get the answer to that question in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when God chooses Abraham, that great chapter of the choice, the election of Abraham, where it says that God has chosen you so that all peoples on earth will be blessed by you. In other words, the purpose of God's choice is always blessing. Election is always for the purpose of blessing. It is not for the purpose of privilege. It is always for the purpose of blessing. And so there's a sense, all peoples on earth will be blessed by you. Now, God is always good to those he doesn't choose. We sometimes think, you know, oh, yeah, that's so terrible. You know, God has chosen some, and what, you know, what's wrong with the others? Now, see, the reality is that when you read the story, especially in Genesis, you get the sense that God is always good to those he doesn't choose. And the rest of the animate life is cared for. It's not that he chooses humanity and ignores the rest. Cain is protected when he murders his brother Abel, as he's sent out, and the mark of Cain is given to him so that no one else will kill him. Uh, Ishmael, even though he's not chosen, will still be blessed, we're told in chapter 16. And we see how the story of how God rescues Ishmael when he's in the desert. Uh, Esau, a prosperous, even though he's not chosen, Jacob is the one who is. And the other 11, besides Joseph's brothers, they are still part of the people uh, of Israel. Even the Noah story tells how God is good to the rest of his creation. He rescues it and redeems it through the flood. But, even though God is good to the whole of his creation, there's a kind of connection between these two things. Because what seems to be the dynamic here is that God chooses some to be a means of blessing the whole. God chooses a part to bless the whole. Now again, we see this pattern throughout Scripture. Out of the whole of creation, God chose the human race, this particular species, to bear his image. And 
To me, that idea of the image of God is not particularly to do with a capacity that we have that other animals don't. Uh, we may have it in greater degree, but other animals seem to be able to communicate. They have some kind of rational uh, ability. They have some uh, ability to, 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 to give affection to one another. And uh, we may have a different degrees of these things than, than others. But the image of God idea seems to be not primarily that capacity that we have particular abilities that others don't, but it's primarily about calling. It's based about what we are called to be and to do. And in fact, what we are called to be and to do is made very clear in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, where it says about how the, 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 human, but the man was called, the man and the woman were called out of creation in order to, to work and to take care of the creation, to be given the work of protection and nurture. So out of the whole of creation, God chooses humanity to be his means of blessing the whole of creation. The purpose of choice is actually not, the end purpose is not humanity, it's the whole of creation. The human race is chosen, endowed with the image of God, precisely so that through the human race, the whole of creation can be cared for, looked after, protected, and worked, nurtured, developed. When you think about that, that's the whole enterprise of technology and science and art and literature is bound up in that very verse to take care of, to nurture, to protect the creation. God chooses one part of it, Abraham and his family, to be the means of blessing the whole of the human race. The reason he chooses Abraham is so that the rest of the human race might be blessed through him. And if we take that on into the New Testament, we can see that, again, out of the whole of the human race, God has chosen the church. He's chosen you. He's chosen me. Why us? I don't know. If it was me, I wouldn't have chosen us. I would have chosen another group of people, probably. But he has. But he's chosen us precisely so that we might be his means of blessing the rest of the human race. So he chooses a part not primarily for the, bless, for the benefit of that part, but precisely through that part, he might bless the whole. Now, you see this through the New Testament, this idea uh, of the election uh, of the church, and the purpose of that election, when you see in 1 Peter 2 where it says this, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's why you're here. That's why we are here. That's why you're a Christian. That's why I'm a Christian. We are chosen that we might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So when you sit yourself in church next time round and that question pops into your mind, what on earth are we doing here? What is the point? That's the answer. We are here so that we might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are oriented, and if you like, within that verse, there's a sort of double orientation there. There's a double connection, as it were, which is our theme for today. We are connected through this calling of God in two directions. We are connected to God in worship, declaring the praises upwards, if you like. But we are connected to our communities in witness and in mission, declaring the praises of God both upwards and outwards. And so the purpose of the church is simply this, it's to be a blessing. It's to be a blessing to the community in which it's placed. And that is true of any local church, it's true of any diocese, it's true of any unit of the church you can think of, whether it's Anglican or Methodist or Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever kind you like, doesn't really matter. The purpose of the church is primarily this, is to be a blessing. And so the fundamental question, and one of the questions, perhaps the, the main question I want to ask this morning is, in what way are you and your church a blessing to your local community? Or to put it slightly differently, if your church disappeared overnight, would anyone notice? I imagine the people who go to church would probably notice, because they've got nothing to do on a Sunday morning. Uh, but would anyone else notice? People who don't go to church. 
Would they feel that something was missing, something was lacking? This element of blessing was somehow disappearing from the local community. Now, that is all by way of saying that that is why we are here. This theme of connection and connecting to our communities is absolutely central to what we are as a church. In a few moments, Emma's going to talk a little bit about this idea of connection to God, which is a really important, vital theme. It's crucial that those two have been put together and this morning. I'm really looking forward to what Emma has to say about, about that. But my focus on this section is this idea of connecting with our communities. I suppose the next question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? Because it seems to me, if we're to be serious about connecting with our communities, if we're serious about this agenda, this agenda of, um, of being a blessing to the communities in which we're placed, we need actually to pay attention to something other than just the church and the communities. It seems to me, you know, we can often, because it fills most of our time, think a lot about church, you know, what, what we do in church, all the stuff that goes on in everyday life in church, and, and we can think of our, of our communities, the people who live in our parishes and uh, neighbourhoods. But if our attention is just on those two things, we're unlikely to be able to fulfil this calling because actually we need an allegiance to something else, a third thing, something beyond both church and community, which is a, this allegiance to something else beyond them. Now this seems to me is what Jesus speaks about all the time because actually when you think about the ministry of Jesus, he doesn't actually talk a great deal about the church that word is only ever used in Matthew's Gospel. He talks about the disciples a bit, but the focus really isn't particularly on them. He doesn't talk a lot about Israel, about the, the wider community in which he and his disciples are set. But what he does talk a lot about is the kingdom of God. And it seems to me that we have to have this focus not just on the church and the community, but on something else beyond both. This theme of the kingdom of God that is connected to but transcends both church and community. We're to have this focus, ultimately, on this space, as it were, this place where God gets his way. Where things happen the way God wants them to happen. Because that's what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is a place where God gets what he wants. It's a place where things happen the way God wants them to happen. It's a way where God gets to call the shots. It is, if you like, another way, a Christian view of the good life. Uh, and we need a sense of that. What are we aiming at? What is the direction? What's the trajectory of what we're doing? Because if you get bogged down in church and community, you can lose that sense. You need something beyond that, this sense of the kingdom of God, which is the trajectory of where we are headed. Now, just a couple of things about the kingdom of God um, that I think are important to grasp. The first is that the kingdom of God is controversial. If we're to have a loyalty, even beyond the church, even beyond our communities, but to the kingdom of God, we need to grasp the kingdom of God is controversial. This is the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. And all the great thinkers on the kingdom over the years, and you think of Augustine uh, with his um, idea of the city of God and the city of this world, you think of, uh, of Luther even, the kingdom, uh, the two kingdoms, uh, and others who've interpreted this idea in different ways. There's always been this opposition between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. This is a space where God gets his way, not the other gods. So the kingdom of God is inherently confrontational and controversial because it opposes other kingdoms and other rules. There's a moment in um, uh, Paul's career when he, when he uh, lands up in Thessalonica, and um, as often seemed to happen when Paul turned up in a place, uh, there was a bit of a riot. Um, people objected to what he was, he was doing, it all got slightly out of hand. And um, there's a point where someone, or someone in the crowd says this about Paul. He says this, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king, one called Jesus. Now, 
because we know that outside the Gospels there's not a great deal of mention of the kingdom of God as a theme. Paul doesn't mention it a great deal. There's not much there in, in, in Acts. But here we get a moment where you can kind of see what it's about. Because actually what the early church was proclaiming, and if you go to the heart of their Gospel, what is the heart of the Gospel that the early apostles preached? And you wanted to boil that down to the shortest phrase you possibly could, uh, you probably would end up with the phrase that they were preaching that Jesus is Lord. That was the heart of the gospel. That's the heart of the good news. Jesus is Lord. Not death and sin and evil and cancer and unemployment and everything else. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. And so this message, which is not of course spoken by a, a, a Christian, um, but they recognized what Paul was about. The idea these people are starting to say that there is another king called Jesus, not Caesar. Caesar is not Lord Jesus Christ is. That was the heart of their message, which is why actually, at the end of the day, Paul and the Gospels actually do come together in the sense of what the kingdom of God is about. And this tells us that, that Jesus' announcement of the kingdom was not primarily an invitation to life after death or an inner spiritual journey, although it included both of those things, but it had very clear material and earthly implications. This kingdom meant, meant change. It meant a revised set of priorities and loyalties here and now. It meant living now in the light of the fact that the kingdom had come in part and was coming in its fullness one day. It meant learning to obey a different set of rules. It meant explicitly rejecting Refusing the other gods, the lordship of other things that might have claim over us. For us, it means rejecting the claim of things like career and wealth and respectability and popularity, the things that we tend to bow down before, and living by another set of rules. It's why real sects always seem slightly mad to us because they don't quite fit. Caesar, of course, called himself Kurios, Lord. But the followers of Jesus refused to call him that. And of course, he got them into trouble, as it did here in Thessalonica. There was a distinctly political, material, and controversial character to this whole scheme. Because if Christ is God's king, there can be no other. There is another king, one called Jesus. And that means that one of the key tasks of the church today, and I think probably one we're not that good at, is to identify the particular areas where we as the church are tempted to forsake our true king and bow down to other gods instead. That, I think, is a crucial task for us. You might say one of the secrets of the early church why the early church grew in the way that it did was their ability to identify the gods of their age and have nothing to do with them. Because the great sin in the early church was idolatry. That's why most of the early Christians were martyred, because they refused to do that. They refused to bow down to the gods. Now, in one sense, we might say it's kind of easy for them because you know what the gods are. There were temples on the corners of the streets, and there were statues. And uh, and, you know, worship was pretty obvious because you had to go along and put in your little sacrifice into the altar and so on. Uh, we don't have that. We don't have too many pagan temples in Bristol these days. Um, but of course we do. We have other gods that we bow down before. And it will be different from place to place. And one of the questions I, I'll pose to you later on in the session towards the end of the session today is, what are the gods of your community, of your parish, of the place where you live. What are the things that people bow down before? And of course there's a very easy test to know what the gods of your community are. It's a very easy test to know what your, my gods really are. And it's to ask this question, because of course worship was always bound up as sacrifice. It always was in the Old Testament. It always is in the New Testament. Pagan uh, worship was all about sacrifice. You sacrifice to the gods. Christian worship is about sacrifice too. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, uh, giving your bodies as a, as a living sacrifice. So the question is this, the thing you worship is the thing that you would sacrifice most for. 
And so if you want to find out what the goals of your community are, you ask this question, what would people here sacrifice most for? Career? Holidays? Family? Football club? What is it? <coughs> that's the goal of your community. And if we're honest, that's our goal too. The thing that we would sacrifice most for. And the rule of these other gods is often so subtle that we don't recognize it. And it's a crucial theological and prophetic task that we have as a church today to identify the gods of our age and have nothing to do with them. I sometimes wonder whether the chief enemy of the church's mission is still idolatry. It's a church which is very, pretty well distinct, indistinguishable sometimes from the culture around it. So I know one listens to us half the time because they can't see any real difference between us and anyone else. Because so often we are bound up in our worship of the gods of wealth and success and popularity and everything else too. So there is the first thing. The kingdom of God is controversial. And we need to develop distinct and different ways that express our loyalty to that kingdom. The picture that I've always found a helpful one uh, about this whole dynamic is, um, is uh, Robin Hood. Um, you've done the films on Robin Hood. Robin Hood, of course, was, uh, or whether he was a historical character or not, we don't quite know, but if he was, uh, he was um, a kind of outlaw uh, during the time when King Richard was away at Crusades and the, his sort of half-brother or whatever, King John, uh, was here in England uh, ruling over the, um, the people who uh, imposed all kinds of taxation and restrictions upon ordinary people in England. And uh, Robin Hood was the leader of a kind of uh, rebel gang uh, who kind of hung out. They couldn't overthrow him, but they were waiting for the real king to come back. One day Richard would come back from the Crusades and he would establish the true and right and proper rule again. But in the meantime, they had to live under the rule of the evil King John. And what they did in the meantime was not just sort of sit there and do nothing, but they did whatever they could to remind people that one day the true king was going to come back again. And that's why they robbed the rich to give to the poor. It's why they did little, little actions, little subversive actions uh, to say, just don't forget, the true king is coming back one day. This order we have now is not the real thing. Don't buy it. And that seems to me just what we are about as a church. So anyway, the kingdom of God is controversial. You can't escape that idea, this controversial nature of the kingdom where it confronts the idols of an age. Second thing about the kingdom of God is that it is creative. <coughs> There's a moment in um, Jesus' ministry where the disciples of John the Baptist uh, come to ask Jesus, is he the one they've been waiting for? They're not sure, but John isn't sure perhaps. Now, is he, is he really the, the, the Messiah? Is he the one they've been waiting for? And um, is he the one who will bring in the kingdom of God? And Jesus answers in this way. He says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, that is what the kingdom of God looks like, here and now. When you see that happening, that's the kingdom of God. And because these things are happening in space around Jesus, you can see this is what it's like when God gets his way. This is what it's like in the kingdom of God. In that little space around Jesus, where the blind see, the lame walk, the sick are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor hear good news. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. That's what blessing looks like. And if you and I are called to be a blessing to our communities, that's what, this is what we're aiming at. This is what we're pointing towards. This is what we're, where, where human life is heading for in terms of its trajectory. And when these things happen, that's when we see the kingdom of God coming. When the blind see, those who cannot see the goodness of the world because they are so mired and sunk in their own um, worlds, those who cannot see any hope for the future, in the kingdom of God their eyes are open to see the beauty of this world and the hope that is there. The lame walk. In the kingdom of God, those who are stuck those who are immobile, those who are static with their life going nowhere. In the kingdom of God, they find new motivation and energy. 
The sick are healed, those who are sick in mind or body or memory. In the kingdom of God, they find healing and restoration, whether it's through prayer or whether it's through the best medical services you can possibly offer. That's what happens. In the kingdom of God, the deaf hear. Those who are deaf to the cries of suffering in the world. Those who are wrapped in their own consumerist world. Who cannot hear the cries of the, of the migrants who are desperate to come to our, our country. Somehow their ears are, are open. Those who are deaf to the good news of Jesus Christ suddenly find their ears open to hear it. The dead are raised. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins or as the message puts it, mired in that old, stagnant life of sin. They are made alive again so they can relate to God, and they, so, they, so that their worlds expand. The poor hear good news. Those who are elderly, those with special needs, those with mental health problems, those people that society tends to push to the edges. In the kingdom of God, they find themselves at the center. They find themselves fated. They're not at the edges, they're not at the per 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 periphery, they're right at the center of what happens. They're not forgotten, but they're valued. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. A place where the blind see, the lame walk, the sick are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor hear good news. So, what can you do? That sounds a pretty big agenda to me. Um, beyond most local churches. And you cannot do everything. But that's why I think we need to take our cue from uh, John's Gospel. And the way he talks about this whole thing, he doesn't talk much about the Kingdom of God, as you know, but what he does talk about is the signs of the Kingdom. Because in John's Gospel, the miracles of Jesus are always referred to as some signs. And of course, signs point to something. And the, the miracles in John's Gospel are not significant in themselves, but they're significant in what they point to. That's incidentally always true of miracles. Uh, if you pray for someone in your church and miraculously they're healed, that's a wonderful thing. But the point of that healing is not just that that person gets better, but it's a sign of something else. It's a sign of the day when one day God will heal all the sicknesses of the world. So it's a sign of something, it points towards something. And that, I think, is what we're called to do when we're thinking about this connecting with our communities. We're to set up signs. Something that points to that kingdom. Something that points beyond the church, beyond the community, to another order of things, to the world where God has his way. So the question is, what would be the most effective sign of the kingdom of God in your neighborhood? What would divine blessing on your community look like? I want to just show you one example of that. There could be many examples. Um, this is a church in, in London that I know quite, uh, quite well, where um, it's actually quite a, quite a young church. Um, it's a church uh, in the kind of Camden Town area of London, Camden Town, if you know, it's pretty edgy, quite sort of, you know, very alternative sort of place. And uh, this is a church of uh, largely young people who come together and to kind of gather and do church. And I think when they started out, this was a kind of new church plant a number of years ago, I think they thought, okay, you know, we're in a pretty cool part of London, uh, we're pretty cool people, uh, we want to do cool things. Uh, we want to reach out to all the other young, cool people around in our area. And they started to try and do that, but they found themselves again and again drawn to something else. But as they thought about their local area, as they looked around it, as they asked, started to ask these very questions, you know, what is God calling us to do here? they become aware of a particular issue, which is the issue of loneliness. That in a place like London, uh, although there are huge numbers of people around, almost everyone's lonely. And particularly, the problem they came across was that there were vast numbers of elderly people in their community who were lonely. And so, they started out to do something. And uh, this little video shows you what they did. Well, that's just one example. That is a sign. That is a sign of the kingdom of God. 
It's just one tiny example of a church thinking about its local community and thinking what would be the most effective sign of the kingdom here. What they did, they started small. They actually then applied for funding for the local authority. They've actually got funding from the local authority for a half-time elderly person's worker on their staff now. Uh, and you can see something bubbling up there. And of course, the result of it has actually been that the church has begun to grow. Because the thing about the kingdom of God is that when people see it and touch it and feel it, it triggers something inside them. Because actually the kingdom of God is where we were always meant to live. That's how we were always meant to be. It triggers a memory. So something St. Augustine, out of all the great theologians, understood more than any others. Uh, if you ever read St. Augustine's um, Confessions, uh, you'll know there's a chapter on, on memory. It's quite a complicated chapter, but uh, actually what he's, he's saying is that every human being has a memory, uh, a kind of deep structural memory uh, of life as it was always meant to be, as it was before the fall. And we are constantly seeking to somehow recreate that and find it again. Uh, and, and everything that we see, that's, that's this whole, whole idea about restlessness that Augustine has. You know, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. But every now and again we see a hint and it reminds us, it provokes the memory. That's what we were meant to be. That's where we were meant to live. And that's what happens when people see the kingdom of God. And of course it leads on to effective evangelism. Because it makes people ask, well, what's going on here? What is this? How come you've got the, 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 the motivation to do this sort of thing? So, let me close with some questions. These are questions that you might want to ponder over coffee or um, uh, as you um, go through the rest of the day. Um, number one, uh, what might your local community look like if the Kingdom of God came tonight? Imagine for a moment, the Kingdom of God came this night. And tomorrow you woke up, the kingdom of God coming on its fullness. What would change in your local community? What would be missing? What would be present? That might give you a little hint as to what the priorities might be for you in setting up signs of the kingdom of God in your neighborhood. That's a work of imagination. To be a Christian needs imagination. You need to imagine what would this community look like if the kingdom of God came. Secondly, what are the idols of your community which your church needs to identify and stand against? Is it comfort? Is it wealth? Is it success? Is it coolness? Is it status? Whatever it is. Number three, what qualities does your church need to focus on learning? Which is connected to the previous question. It may be that if the idol in your community is wealth, what you need to focus on learning is generosity. If the idol of your community is success, what you need to begin to teach people to learn how to do is to live with integrity, whether success happens or not. If the idol of your community is comfort, and ease, and an affluent lifestyle, maybe the thing you need to teach your people in churches is actually to live with simplicity. Other questions? <laughs> Can you think of gestures, programs, or lifestyle choices which your church or individuals within it might adopt, which would express the marks of the kingdom or opposition to the idols? There might be tiny little things. I knew a church once where they, they did this exercise, they looked around, and one of the things that they, they saw with the, the idols of their community was the car. And the car was king, everyone drove everywhere. And you know, the, the, the smarter your car, the better it was. So they did a little thing, they tried to kind of say, okay, as far as possible, we're going to walk. We're going to walk to church on a Sunday. We're not going to take the car out as much as we can. We're actually going to buy simple cars that don't actually that are flashy. This is a little way of saying, we don't believe in the idols. We believe in Jesus Christ as well instead. And then lastly, what one thing can you do as a church with the resources and people you have to bring the blessing or rule of God to your neighborhood? And if there's one question I want you to take away from this session, it's that one there. What is the one thing that God is calling you to do that would bring the rule of blessing of God to your community? It may be something you've discovered already. How can you build on that? It may be something you haven't yet discovered. What is God calling you to do as you seek to be the blessing to your community that God has called you to be?